be on this campus and in your presence is always a joy. I should like, as a matter of personal privilege, to express in my capacity as Vice Chairman of Board of Trustees of this University, our respect, appreciation, and love for President Merrill Bateman and his associates, and the faculty, and the staff of this university. And on the personal basis, I consider him to be a treasured, valued friend. I'm grateful for this wonderful music which the men's chorus provided for us. And appreciate the presence of each and all. I must confess that I feel overwhelmed at the prospect of addressing so many of you and saying something that will justify taking you away from your studies. I do not have all the answers to life's questions. I don't even know all the questions. I feel a little bit like the college professor who asked a student during an examination, does the question embarrass you? Not at all, sir, replied the student, not at all. It is quite clear. It's the answer that bothers me. <laughs> My beloved companion of 56 years is here with me today. I express appreciation to her. She has walked with me in a joint search for happiness, which on my part has exceeded my fondest hopes and expectations. Indeed, it is our search for happiness that I wish to discuss today. Having lived quite a few years now, I have included that since we don't always desire that which is good, having all of our desires granted to us would not bring us happiness. In fact, instant and unrestrained gratification of all of our desires would be the shortest and most direct route to unhappiness. The many years I have spent listening to the tribulations of men and women have persuaded me that both happiness and unhappiness are of our own making. Happiness is the object and design of our existence, as the prophet Joseph Smith said, and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. And this path is virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping all of the commandments of God, close quote. The more faithfully we keep the commandments of God, the happier we'll be. Although men are that they might have joy, this does not mean that our lives will be filled only with joy. For it must needs be that there is opposition in all things. The football team found this out last Thursday night. <laughs> They'll probably find it out again day after tomorrow. <laughs> Happiness is not given to us in a package that we can keep and just open up and consume. Nobody is happy 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Rather than thinking in terms of a day, we perhaps need to snatch happiness in little pieces, learning to recognize the elements of happiness and then treasuring them while they last. Pleasure is often confused with happiness, but is by no means synonymous with it. The poet Robert Burns wrote an excellent definition of pleasure in these lines. But 
pleasures are like poppies spread. You seize the flower, its bloom is shed. Or, like the snow falls in the river, a moment white, then melts forever. Or, like the borealis rays that flit ere you can point their place. Or, like the rainbow's lovely form, evanishing amid the storm. Pleasure, unlike happiness, is that which pleases us or gives us gratification. Usually it endures for only a short time. As President David O. McKay once said, you may get transitory pleasure, yes, but you cannot find joy. You cannot find happiness. Happiness is found only along that well-beaten track, narrow as it is, though straight, which leads to eternal life." Close quote. We are enticed daily to pursue worldly pleasures that may divert us from the path to happiness, but the path to true and lasting happiness is repeating the prophet Joseph Smith's words. Virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping all the commandments of God. Emerson said, rectitude is a perpetual victory, celebrated not by cries of joy, but by serenity, which is joy fixed or habitual. Your presence here today indicates that you shared the desire to be happy with all mankind since the beginning. Obviously, there is a great difference between feeling happy at a given moment and being happy for a lifetime. Between having a good time and leading a good life, most of you being Americans, claim the pursuit of happiness among your inalienable rights as set forth by our founding fathers. This concept, however, was not introduced by them, however, as the early philosophers like Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, Locke, Aquinas, Mill opined that happiness is the most fundamental of all human searches. The Russian writer Tolstoy, speaking through Pierre Bazukov, in War and Peace stated, Man is created for happiness, that happiness lies in himself. It is a satisfaction of his natural human cravings, that all unhappiness rises not from privation but from superfluity. So often we find ourselves striving for superfluity. We are not content with that which we have and think that happiness comes from having more or acquiring more or being more. We look for happiness but go in the wrong direction to find it. The story is told of Ali Hafid, the wealthy ancient Persian who owned much land and many productive fields with orchards and gardens and money out at interest. He had a lovely family and at first was contented because he was wealthy and wealthy because he was contented. An old priest came to Ali Hafid and told him that if he had the diamond the size of his thumb he could purchase a dozen farms like his. Ali Hafid said, Will you tell me where I can find the diamonds? The priest told him, If you will find a river that runs over white sands, between high mountains, in those white sands, you will find diamonds. Well, Ali Hafid said, I will go. So he sold his farm, collected his money that it was at interest, and left his family in charge of a neighbor, and away he went in search of diamonds. 
traveling through many lands of Asia and Europe. After years of searching, his money was all spent, and he found himself in rags and wretchedness. Meanwhile, a man who purchased Ali Hafid's farm one day led his camel into the garden to drink. And as the animal put his nose in the shallow waters, the farmer noticed a curious flash of light in the white sands of the stream. Reaching in, he pulled out a black stone containing a strange eye of light. Not long after, the same old priest came to visit Ali Hafid's successor and found that in the black stone was a diamond. As they rushed out into the garden and stirred up the white stands with their fingers, they came up with many more beautiful, valuable gems. According to the story, this marked the discovery of the diamond mines of Golconda, the most valuable diamond mines in the history of the ancient world. Had Ali Hafid remained at home and dug in his own cellar or anywhere in his own fields, rather than traveling in strange lands where he eventually faced starvation and ruin, he would have found acres of diamonds. We can only feel pity for Ali Hafid as we picture him wandering homeless and friendless farther and farther away from the happiness he thought he would find in digging up diamonds in a far-off place. Yet how many times we look for our own happiness at a distant space or time rather than right now in our own homes, our own families, our own friends. The Savior of the world taught us to seek that inner peace which taps the innate happiness in our souls. He said, My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. When we were living in Sao Paulo, Brazil, a new home was being constructed next to ours. The workmen on the project were paid only a few cents an hour and worked from six in the morning till six in the evening. Yet they whistled and sang all day long. Sometimes it was more than we wanted to hear. But I never had the heart to tell them to tone it down. A few years ago, I interviewed a relative young man who's being called as a mission president. He had a very successful career as an investment counselor. Because he had a young family, I was concerned about how he would take care of them when he returned from the mission field. He made it very clear that he was not interested in making large sums of money. He explained that he had worked for the very wealthy. To him, they did not seem happy or fulfilled and seemed only preoccupied with acquiring more. The inner peace spoken of by the Savior seems elusive when we are preoccupied with things we have or things we wish we had. In a time when we are both obsessed and consumed with the possession and the acquisition of objects, the counsel of Moses seems to be more needed than ever. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. We're indebted to Dr. Homer Ellsworth for sharing with us many years ago two contrasting stories about happiness of mothers. Often in the days when the gender of the child could not be predetermined, the expectant mothers were very set upon having a boy or a girl. And sometimes when the 
baby was not of the anticipated gender, the mother was temporarily disappointed. Of course, this disappointment was soon forgotten as soon as the mother cuddled her newborn for the first time. Dr. Ellsworth told us that a few new mothers demonstrated their immaturity for a day or two. One who wanted a baby boy and happy happened to receive a baby girl showed her displeasure by throwing tantrums and objects all over the hospital room for a day or two. One wise old nurse, when feeding time came, took a baby boy born with a small facial deformity from the nursery and quietly slipped him into the disconsolate mother's arms. The immature mother exclaimed, this is not my child. The wise old nurse says, well, it has the right sex. Maybe its mother would be willing to trade babies with you. There followed no more demonstrations of immaturity. In contrast, some years ago, a special child was born to a young mother. This child was born without eyes. It was normal in all other respects, except there was nothing to resemble eyes or sockets above the nose. The wise mother might, in bitterness, have said, why did this have to happen to my child? Why did this happen to happen to me? Instead, she said, the Lord must really love us and have confidence in us. We really must be favored to have been given this child. To think the Lord picked our home, knowing how much special love and care this child would need, it is very humbling and comforting. We are grateful for this special child and for the blessings it will bring in our home. The story of the little prince in the story of the little prince, the fox, was wiser than he knew when he said, now here is my secret. It is a very simple secret. It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. The odyssey to happiness lies in the dimension of the heart. Such a journey is made on stepping stones of selflessness, wisdom, contentment, and faith. The enemies of progress and fulfillment are such things as self-doubt, poor self-image, self-pity, bitterness, and despair. By substituting simple faith and humility for these enemies, we can move rapidly in our search for happiness. Happiness has a price, as President Kimball said in The Miracle of Forgiveness. What is the price of happiness? One might be surprised at the simplicity of the answer. The treasure house of happiness is unlocked when those who live the gospel of Jesus Christ in its purity and simplicity. Like a mariner without stars, like a traveler without a compass, is the person who moves along through life without a plan. The assurance of supreme happiness, the certainty of a successful life here, and of exaltation in the life hereafter comes to those who plan to live their lives in complete harmony with the gospel of Jesus Christ and then consistently follow the course they have set. Selfish pride and happiness don't go together. Nephi tells us that we must come down to the depths of humility. The things of the wise and the prudent shall be hid forever. Yea, that happiness which is prepared for the saints. The Lord, speaking through King Benjamin, reminds us, 
I would desire that ye should consider on the blessed and happy state of those that keep the commandments of God. For behold, they are blessed in all things, both temporal and spiritual. And if they hold out faithful to the end, they are received into heaven, and thereby they may dwell with God in a state of ever-ending happiness. Many speak these days about the rights of consumers to enjoy products that are free, perfect, and now. That is, low cost, no defects, and immediate service. The problem is, too many of us try to consume happiness rather than generate it. Shakespeare expressed a philosophy and as you like it which seems to be commendable. I am a true laborer. I earn that I eat. Get that I wear. Owe no man hate. Envy no man's happiness. Glad of other men's good. Earning what we eat will make itself sufficient. But giving back a little by helping our neighbor or our fellow students will bring us something more. For example, if you deliver to an atomic energy breeder reactor the energy of three truckloads of fuel, it will return the energy of four or five truckloads of fuel. Happiness, like the breeder reactor, adds and multiplies as we divide it with others. I realize that many of you students are not very wealthy. One student said, I know that money isn't everything. For example, it isn't mine. <laughs> Another observed, even books on how to be happy without money cost more than I can afford. <laughs> However, the relationship of money to happiness is at best questionable. An unknown author said, money is an article which may be used as a universal passport to everywhere except heaven as a universal provider for everything except happiness. Heinrich Gibson reminds us, money may buy the husk of many things, but not the kernel. It brings food, but not the appetite. Medicine, but not health. Acquaintances, but not friends servants, but not faithfulness, days of joy, but not peace or happiness. An unknown poet has written, success is speaking words of praise, in cheering other people's ways, in doing just the best you can with every task and every plan. It's silence when your speech would hurt, lightness when your neighbor's curt, it's deafness when scandal flows, and sympathy with others' woes, it's loyalty when duty calls, it's courage when disaster falls, it's patient when the hours are long, it's found in laughter and in song. It's in the silent time of prayer, in the happiness and in despair, in all of life, nothing less, we find the thing called success. In summation, our search for happiness largely depends on the degree of righteousness we obtain, the degree of selflessness we acquire, the amount quality of service remember, 
the inner peace which we enjoy, we also have some external sources of happiness, including those loved ones and friends whose smile and regard mean so much to us. In my case, the members of my family who are here today. Our destinies are bound by ties of common interest and sympathy to a host of others unknown to us personally within and without the church. Some of you here today may have detoured from the road to peace and happiness through transgression. With all my heart, I urge you to begin the process of clearing up any problem so that you may again enjoy a quiet and peaceful conscience. When we truly repent of our sins, the Lord has promised, I, the Lord, will remember them no more. May I suggest a further requisite in the continuing quest to live happily every hour, every day, every month, and every year of our lives. The golden pathway to happiness is the selfless giving of love, the kind of love that has concern and interest and some measure of charity for every living soul. Love is the direct route to the happiness which would enrich and bless our lives and the lives of others. It means that you can show love even to your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you. In those so doing, you will be fulfilled in the greater commandment to love God himself and to enjoy his love. You will soar above the ill winds that blow, above the sordid, the self-defeating, and the bitter. You will have the promise that your whole bodies will be filled with light, and there shall be no darkness in you, and that the body which is filled with the light comprehendeth all things. I wish to bear my testimony and witness to you who are gathered here of the divinity and the truthfulness of this holy work in which we're engaged. I have had spiritual confirmations come throughout my life which permit me to say to you that I don't believe I know. I know. I pray the Lord's blessings to be with all who are associated with this great institution in any capacity and that peace and joy and happiness will be ours, and I do this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.